Hey everyone, welcome back to the Wealth Preservation Podcast. Super excited uh, for today's guest is someone from my past, uh, but but first uh, we will do a quick uh, introduction. I'll, I'm, as always, Mark Scyther, uh, co-host, and I have Josh uh, co-hosting as well. Hey everybody, Josh, how's it going? We're excited to inter- uh, interview another awesome entrepreneur and somebody that is doing something really cool and what some people might think crazy, but we think it's awesome. So uh, welcome. Yes. And uh, so today we have Chad Yarbitz of Explicit Fitness and his new launch, uh, Count It. So Chad, how uh, how's it going and where hey, are you Hey, you guys. Out Thanks of? for having me on. It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm honored. And uh, I'm recording out of San Diego, California. We got uh, 95 degree weather, I think, today. It's a little early in the season, but, you know, trying to stay cool. Well, well here in Tennessee, it's 32. So it's supposed to be 31 we're... tomorrow. So oh. exciting. Yeah. 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 We could just but meet in the thinking, middle. It was like seventy-eight. It was like seventy-eight three <laughs> days ago. So you know, welcome kind of the Midwest in the in the springtime. Right for for anyone who's not familiar with uh, San Diego, being ninety-five is like if you uh, saw that Palm Springs was people are dying. Yeah, so yeah. people are uh, right. or yeah. acting like yeah. they're dying. People are dying for sure. <laughs> like what? Do, what do I do with my sweatshirt? I have to take it off. What? And, right. Yeah. <sighs> if only there was a giant body of water I could jump into. <laughs> ah, totally. <laughs> Uh, well, awesome. Well, hey, before we get going, uh, can you give everyone a quick, you know, maybe two minute rundown of Explicit Fitness, Count It, and really your, you know, what sure. you're doing? Yeah, there. so Explicit Fitness is my uh, boutique fitness facility in San Diego. Uh, I formed the company in August of 2010 out of my garage in a house I was renting. And since then, we've expanded, contracted, um, profited, lost, uh, almost gone out of business almost almost uh franchise you name it we've done it and um we're at a point now after covid that we have a new model new logo new brand new boutique fitness facility that we're on the verge of franchising so long story short we've we've made it through uh, quite a few storms and we've been able to um put what we offer as a service into a package that we can create into a product and duplicate and part of that success is coming from our sister company, Count It. And Count It is a technology company utilizing a sensor mat that I came across in 2019 and uh, fell in love with it. Um, and long story short of that is that we've implemented that in our club. We've installed it and custom built it into our boxing bags so we can track and measure uh, boxing metrics. And that's kind of allowed us to simplify and um, automate what we offer and gamify what we offer and give a really cool and fun user experience. And that's kind of where we're at today. That's awesome. So Chad, first question that I have though, is like, you know, you had the peaks and the valleys though. One of those valleys had to be when Mark worked for you, right? That was probably a low point. I'm guessing, you know, I didn't want to say anything, but yeah, 2014 <laughs> around then was a pretty low point in the career. <laughs> In this the gym's is, I, history. I had to realize maybe we should have someone who, uh, I don't know, has a shred of intelligence before. <laughs> those are, those are dark days, huh, Chad? Dark oh, days. Oh, the worst. Yeah. Like, Mark just lost a fight to a punching bag. So uh, we, knew, we, knew, we, we knew you were special. But, no, yeah. in all honesty, that was, a, that was actually a really, a really fun time in the club. Uh, Mark was great and always had great energy and great uh, – enthusiasm for fitness and now, honestly that's all that really matters um that that supersedes your knowledge in the fitness industry when it comes to being an effective and fun trainer that you want working for you especially in in this boutique side of things um that was an interesting time for us though it was a transition time we went from being in a smaller off off the beaten path industrial center that was 1900 square feet which came after my garage and he was with us during the transition into a 6,200 square foot facility where uh, my younger, dumber self um, with a larger ego than I have today thought we were going to create this multiplex um, fitness, uh, basically sports specific center that was going to have everything from exercise to recovery to acupuncture to chiropractic. And then we were going to franchise that monster. Um Luckily, we didn't, and I didn't uh, pull the trigger on trying to open multiple locations because it would have failed miserably. But uh, it was a good time. It was a it was a very uh, educational time 
for me and for the company um, to grow to that size and then have to learn the hard way, which I always do, that bigger is not always better. Mark, you can leave that joke alone. I just won't even touch that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm. I was about ready to say something. I was like, for hey, it. cut that out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you teed it up for us and everything on that one. That is what I <laughs> tell my wife. Is. Yeah, you said it on the <laughs> all perfect. Uh. Yeah. Uh, I could have said, I mean, my wife doesn't listen to my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, well, okay. So let's, you know, before we dive too much into, you know, into that setting, because that, you know, want to hear the, the hard lessons and everything, but let's take a step back first and just get an idea. Cause we're always looking at like, okay, are entrepreneurs made? Are they born? Right. Um, what was eight year old Chad like? Right. I mean, did you think, Hey, I'm going to be a fitness uh, monster. Or did you did you think just think like well, I'm just gonna go punch a clock or sell candy? You know what what was eight year old Chad? I think like? This is gonna be a therapy session. Um, it is. We don't we don't charge for them either, so it's okay. Uh, we just post eight, them online. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I'm gonna spread me all over the internet. Uh, eight year old Chad Chad was a pretty troubled kid. Um, I grew up in a in a loving household, but um, it was there was a lot of fighting between my parents. I took that out on on other people in my life, classmates, friends, I got in a lot of fights. And a lot of it was uh, the elementary school that I went to. It was a lot of mixed, high, high income, low income, just all different neighborhoods kind of in this mishmash public school system. And so I got in a lot of fights and a lot of them were my fault. A lot of them weren't, but I was kind of, I was insecure and I was uh, uh, unsure of my place in the world. Like I think most seven and eight year olds are, you know, you're trying to just figure things out. You're trying to just understand your environment around you. So I became very competitive. Um, and I became very competitive in sports that involved violence because it was a, it was a good outlet for me. I loved karate. I loved martial arts and I fell in love with American football. Um, and it saved me to be honest, because uh, instead of fighting in school and ending up in, in, you know, in trouble with the law or, or worse, who knows, I, I had an outlet for my aggression and my temper. And over the course of years, maturing, I was able to channel that into what what I have today. But I was I did want to be the best I wanted to hang with my classmates, I was not a very um, intelligent kid from from a classroom standpoint, I was always kind of one step behind all my friends were in the gate program. If you guys remember gate, if you even had it at your schools, it was just kind of like the, like the AP of, of elementary school. Right. And yeah, so I, I, I was just, in the, I was in the gated program that you couldn't go past the gate. You, could, like, no, you were, you were in the pen. Gated in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The farm yeah. pen. So yeah. I, um, I, I struggled because I wanted to be like them. I wanted to hang and then I would get into these programs cause I worked hard enough and I just, I just didn't have the, the intelligence to hang. And so I always felt like I was, uh, less than my friends. So I made up for it with physicality. I made up for it in, in something that I could excel at, which was sports. Which uh, kind of brings up a good, good point. I mean, not business related, but, but the, uh, the channeled anger, right? I mean, there's that, that uh, quote that's been going around from that um, uh, Jordan Peterson guy where he's like, you shouldn't, you should want to be, it's good to be dangerous, but have it under control. Uh, Yeah. Right. And, and aggression is not bad. Aggression and anger is not bad. It's, it's controlling it that, you know, cause if you don't have that, then you're harmless and that's not exactly well, what's good. the saying. Uh, it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Right. Yes. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yes. And I do agree yeah. with that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's in our, it's yeah. in our human nature to be violent. Unfortunately, it's just, we're, we like to think of ourselves as these, uh, these very intelligent complex human beings that are beyond the primitive stage, but really we're just um, more pale monkeys and uh, we do a lot of dumb yeah. stuff. So a lot of that comes down to just, just nature and our chemical makeup, genetic makeup. We can't help that. We're going to be aggressive and, and frustrated and angry. And so it's just about what you do with it and learning not to bottle it up. Yeah. That's been uh, a big, big challenge for a lot of people. Right. If, if any of our listeners are priding themselves on being a peaceful human being, uh, go call at and T's one eight hundred number, and after about ninety minutes, uh, you know, right. take a video of yourself. So, yep. Uh, well, where 
And and where did you grow up? Did you grow up? Yeah, in Southern California, a town called uh, Santa Clarita. Um, some of you might know it by the Santa Clarita Diet, which I think was like a Netflix special or something. Um, I've never seen it. Probably terrible depiction of the town. Valencia, Magic Mountain, Six Flags, Magic Mountain. Yeah, so I was going to be Magic Mountain. That's a Santa yeah. Clarita's yeah. Magic. No diet, Magic exactly. Mountain, baby. Yeah, yeah, that's what everybody knows yeah. it by. So the, um, the Viper and uh, what was the big? What was it? Colossus? Yes. Was oh, dude. Yeah. You're a, yeah, you're a veteran. Yeah. Uh, Viper's Absolutely. one that you beg for when you're a kid. You can't wait to get 48 inches tall. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, Absolutely. Santa Clarita was an interesting town. Um, back then, it was uh, somewhat underdeveloped, so it was kind of like a country town in the city, just outside the city. So uh, a lot of mixed, like I said, mixed incomes. We had um, really wealthy people up on the hill, and then we had people in poverty next to the, the railroad tracks. So uh, it was a really good mix. And when, uh, so when you were growing up there, did you have uh, entrepreneurial family members or someone that you kind of saw that was like, hey, they don't go to work at eight and go work for someone else? And I kind of think that that's awesome. Or or did you have any? Yeah, it's a good that? question. My dad was in the car industry and that Santa Clarita was known for for the auto mall that was there. There was some major um, car dealerships there. And he was, he was a big player in the, in the auto industry back then. And so while he was an employee of a, of a car dealership, he basically ran the show. So I learned from him, went to work with him, went to the auto auctions with him. And he, he kind of wrote his own ticket and didn't have a boss and did things his way. And I think uh, through osmosis, I kind of absorbed that mentality myself and, uh, and that's where I got that. I guess that's where I got my entrepreneurial spirit from. Um, not to mention, I was mm-hmm. I was trying to uh, be an exterminator on my block when I was eight, seven, eight years old. People had a hornet's nest, and I wanted to throw rocks mm-hmm. at it and charge them for it. And tried mowing people's lawns with a <laughs> pair of scissors. Like I said, I wasn't the most intelligent guy, but I was definitely motivated. <laughs> Do you charge per uh, bee sting or yeah. per hornet sting? Like, hey, I'll get rid of your hornets, but I charge right. per, this, if I you know, per sting. window, that's your fault. That just comes oh. with the job. <laughs> Part of the, the dangers of extermination <laughs> with rocks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You can, have a, you can have a hornet's nest or they a broken can, window. Or you can which have one? a hornet's nest and a broken yeah. window, which with they can get into your house. Because I won't get the hornet's yeah. nest down. Oh. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And, and I mean, so, so you got to see your dad kind of, you know, run his own thing and, and, uh, you know, kind of, that kind of gave you that, that insight of like, okay, you don't have to just, it was the hustle. I think it, it, not only that it was, it was definitely yeah. independence, but it was the hustle. My dad was the ultimate hustler and, uh, never tired, never seemed to get sick of it, never seemed to, to get fatigued. And, um, that can be good and bad, right? It kind of instills in you the image that you want. Of, of someone who works hard and isn't easily dissuaded from their goals. But, you know, you go to the opposite extreme, hustle culture has become something that, and hustle porn, as they call it, has be, has okay. gotten to the opposite side where everyone feels like if they're not working 80-hour weeks, then they're a failure. And if they are taking personal time for vacation or friends or family, then they're not prioritizing making money and trying to advance their career, which obviously we know is not good also. They need to go to the gym. They just need to get in the gym some more. Yeah. yeah. Number one, baby. Yeah. Come on, guys. Oh, shit. Get in there. <laughs> uh, well, per- so, so um, you know, out of high school, did you did you go to college? Did you think, hey, the college career is for me and going to go get a degree? Or did you jump right into right Yeah, into another good question. I uh, So I was banking on a, on a football scholarship for a while. Um. But being a five foot eight white boy with not the fastest wheels, you know, there's not a lot of room for me in the in the football lineup. Um, but there was some politics in school. And that's when I got into boxing, which we can get into a little bit later. But to answer your question more direct, I I did not. I didn't think I was going to go to college or at least a big college. I just didn't have the I didn't have all, all the pencils sharpened in the box of mine. I uh, scored like a 960 on my SAT. And uh, instead of trying to take it a second time, I decided, okay, I think the car business is more my speed. Um, so no. And, and then once I finished high school, I was kind of lost because uh, I hadn't been boxing at that time. Football was not an option. So I went to the local JC, like a lot of kids do, just to start trying to knock out some some general education and maybe find some direction while I was focusing on and flirting with the idea of going into the car business. 
Yeah, so kind of how did that next evolution come about? Because, you know, a, a lot of times things happen kind of serendipitously, right? Like it was, you know, kind of meant to be, you just didn't know it was meant to be yet mm-hmm. um, type situation. So kind of what was that next metamorphosis while you're sitting at JC was, you know, you're probably goofing around like I was in junior college and taking classes. Yeah. And, you know, not taking it too seriously oh. and, and kind of doing your thing. And, you know, kind of what was that next evolutionary step? Yeah. Yeah. Uh... I am a firm believer everything happens for a reason as long as you keep a positive attitude, right? At some point, you're going to land in the right place. And my life, if I could, if, if at that age, at 19, 18, 19, you tell me what the next, you know, 15, 20 years was going to be like, I'd tell you you're crazy because I didn't, I didn't think it was going to turn out to be the way it is now. But essentially what had happened, I spent a little time, I did one semester at my JC, and then we went and watched my sister get married up in North Idaho. And I'm a SoCal kid, right? So i gone to the snow to snowboard and but basically outside of that i've never lived outside of santa clarita uh we went and saw her get married in springtime up in Coeur d'Alene, idaho which was just beautiful i mean it's paradise my friends had gotten into a lot of bad stuff my close group of buddies uh, mm-hmm. a lot of them had overdosed many of them were popping pills on heroin or just heading down kind of a dead-end path and i was itching to get away from that uh, i didn't want to get sucked into that And uh, I was still motivated. I was a hustler, but I didn't really have any place to to direct that energy. So my family being this crazy ass family that they are, I had moved 17 times by the time I was 17. And we can go into the reasons why my parents were financially illiterate and that happened. But um, we decided to pick up and move to North Idaho because we loved it so much. So sold the house, parents got out of debt, bought a cheaper house up in Idaho. And I went and lived up there for exactly seven months, which was exactly one winter. And uh, <laughs> I needed to get the hell out of there. But <laughs> it was, if I could, if I look back and look at one period in my life, that was probably the most important transitional period to set the stage for the rest of my life. It was that move to Idaho. I cut the ties, I cut the chains, I cut everything that was my support system and my comfort zone. I had to go and leave my friends behind, leave my girlfriend behind and make, make new friends. It was a culture shock. You know, North right. Idaho is a lot different than Southern California. The people are different. The climate is different. Um, literally everything is different. So being up there uh, was transformative. I, I probably was the most depressed I ever got within that seven months, missing my ex-girlfriend and missing my friends and my former life and feeling completely lost. But at the same time, being proud and finding myself and saying, hey, Chad, you got nothing to fall on now. You got nothing to direct you now. Who are you? It was kind of my first introspection onto who the hell I am. And then it helped gain some clarity on what I needed to do next. Which is, you know, I think one of the takeaways from that too is yeah you had the awareness right to know like hey my buddies are doing dumb stuff uh and not ruling out the possibility that you would do oh, the yeah. dumb stuff too right mm-hmm. i mean a lot of people are like oh well, that's a that's i would never do that and it's like well you hang around it a lot you know long enough you know just takes one one bad evening where you're like all right f it you, you hang know, out with with a group of once, ducks long enough right? you start to quack you know it's, it's right. only a matter yeah, of time. absolutely only man. And I and I'm I was no saint. Yeah. I did party. I love to party. I love drinking and partying and and getting a good buzz on. And so I knew I was susceptible to falling into the same traps that they did. Um, and so I knew I need, I, I had to get away from it. Yeah, yeah. So when you when you moved back, did you move back uh, uh, back down to Santa Clarita area, or did you go? So here's where the plot thickens. So um, I have a history of following females around the country. Um, uh, I, my ex-girlfriend who was my high school sweetheart, right. she, I, I decided we were going to make that relationship work at 19, knowing everything. And she moved yeah. to San Luis Obispo and, uh, and joined the sorority. So every time we talked, of course, she's having a good time. There's dudes in the background and I'm losing my mind because uh, there's my hot girlfriend down there. And here I am up in a, in the weird part of, of the United States. So, <laughs> right. um, I needed out, obviously, like missing home, uh, obviously feeling lost up in Coeur d'Alene was one thing, but being lovesick, 19-year-old lovesick uh, is a, a type of power and kryptonite that I haven't found yet to be as, as strong. So I decided I was going to move to San Luis Obispo, where my ex-girlfriend was, and build my life there. 
And I had a plan to go along with it, though. It wasn't like, hey, I'm moving there. Come high water. Hell or high water. I'll live on the beach sand if I have to. It was, okay, there is some opportunity down there. I did get a job in, in Coeur d'Alene at a local club, a fitness club, uh, working the floor. And got and that was like my the seed that I had planted in the fitness industry. Um, I had done some training in high school, too. So this was kind of like my real first step into the industry. It was my first real job. Um, right. I had a couple odds and end jobs in high school, but I, I had actually gotten employed as a trainer in North Idaho fitness and decided I was going to go down to San Luis Obispo, get a job, become a personal trainer, which had then become kind of my dream and, uh, and figure it out. Get, I, I, my girlfriend at the time helped me find, uh, an apartment on Craigslist with a random roommate that I had never met, packed up my stuff. She flew up. We drove, drove my lowered Dodge Dakota RT packed full of stuff, bottoming out every little bump in the road, scraping um, all the way back down to California. And that was kind of my start back in California, and I haven't left since. Yeah, so did you go back into the fitness industry when you moved back to San Luis Obispo, or was it kind of, there was a, yeah, I mean, you don't have to say it. I was just, it was yeah, else. no, it's, um, I, I wanted to right away, but it was hard. Like, no one was hiring. Um, yeah. It was, you know, this was 2000. Seven, late 2006, 2007, like kind of the beginning of the recession, things were kind of starting to get a little bit weird. Yeah. And I had no skills. You know, I was a floor trainer at North Idaho Fitness. I wanted to jump right into being a personal trainer. You know, you got to have certifications, you got to have experience in that. So right. went and applied at Verizon and uh, they told me to sell them a pen. I don't think I sold the pen the right way. And I did not get hired for that job. <laughs> uh, in hindsight, probably the best failure of my life because who knows where I'd be now in the, in the thralls of. Verizon customer service. Um, but I did end up getting a job at, at uh, Kennedy Club Fitness, which is the premier fitness uh, health club chain in the Central Coast. They have, I think, four locations, family owned, super great family, amazing company to work for. And I started at the front desk and folding towels and um, also vacuuming in the locker room, looking at old men, naked men, which was really a motivator to not do that um it was a motivation to get my personal training certification as soon as possible yeah just you know I, we'll, we'll take this down a dark path but why do old guys in the gym always want to talk to you with their leg up on the bench blow drying blow drying ball. like yeah just more than like... one i thought the first guy was nuts i came across lit at least three old dudes who regularly leg up yeah. blow drying the, the boys and i'm just like i don't, I don't get it. I, like man I, we can have a conversation but you don't have to just yeah yeah like does it take you half hour yeah. to put on clothes like what's know, the man. what's the time crunch here yeah what's the time crunch dress? yeah I, i'm I like, like a minute and a half oh. don't get me and, wrong man I, I and no i'm not gonna hold the I, blow dryer i like being naked dude but <laughs> let's put it in there's a time and place and it's not it's not making eye contact with another dude it's so if you unless take, that's your one... thing if that's your thing that's your thing but if it's mutually not your thing then we shouldn't yeah then we don't need to be Right. You know, we can mutually agree to make that not each other's thing. It's fine. Okay right. Right. Yeah. Well, if we learned no. anything from this podcast today, it's yeah. don't use the hair dryers at the uh, at the gym. So there we go. Right. Because it's <laughs> yeah, directly don't. under and there's still some like, there's yeah, runoff. There's, don't don't it's use like the hair a rain dryers gutter. at the gym. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's runoff. There you go. <laughs> then you get. Yeah. Uh, okay. We'll put yeah. that as the Woo. number one quote from not the podcast, expect Mark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't use. There's a lot. Yeah. There, a lot of things I can tell you not to touch at the old man testicle runoff. <laughs> so that that had motivated me to get to be to become a personal trainer um of among other things and okay. i did and i got certified and i became a floor trainer up there and just learned from the ground up what it means to run a fitness center i mean so i thought right like you think yeah. you know everything at that age plus being in a couple positions in a club i had some good experience and so um what's nice is that i did have some boxing experience uh uh, basically self-taught and uh, um if we back up to high school and and elementary school I, my my father put me into uh, karate wasn't a very practical way to defend yourself you're not going to throw a flying rainbow kick or axe kick on somebody on the playground that's punking you in the alleyway so he put me into boxing which was actually obviously a very practical fight sport um boxing was fun but chasing girls and drinking beer was a lot more fun and so i kind of stopped boxing pursued football so on and so forth 
we fast forward to my days now, 2006, 2007 in Kennedy Club Fitness, I've got an opportunity to be a trainer. And now I've got an opportunity to start teaching people the basics of boxing, which I felt I had a pretty good grasp on. And so I started to do that there and realized that that was kind of a niche that people were really interested in. And that was right. really when Explicit <clears throat> Fitness was born. I have the original envelope that I had sent myself. This is like the ghetto way to, to trademark, right? You send yourself uh, a certified mail um, of your trademark drawing and whatever art you want to capture. And so I still have that as, mm -hmm. as a reminder of where I came from. I am being a, being a family run company. These people were super open to stuff. Um, I approached the general manager, Brett and said, Hey, Brett, I'm, I've been doing some personal training with boxing. He's like, Hey, I see that people seem to love it. I said, is there any way you'd let me do a group class? Cause I had, I have looked through what's the best way to make the most amount of money in this industry. At least I was smart enough to say, if I'm going to make a career out of this, I want to maximize my time. And I was sure. seeing that there were some other trainers doing some small group and, and partner stuff. And it doesn't take, well, uh, you know, rocket scientists to realize the more people you can have packed into the same amount of time, the higher your earning potential goes. So I uh, approached him and said, Hey, I'd like to do a small group boxing thing. He says, Oh, at first, he says, you know, we haven't had any success with that. We tried a kickboxing program in the past. It kind of fell apart, blah, blah. And I said, this is different. My experience is different. It's not kickbacks, boxing. It's not cardio kick. I want to have a speed bag, a double end bag, a heavy bag. I told him exactly what I wanted. Six person classes. Give me a chance. They had a, a sec, uh, their first location club, which is actually on Hygiera Street in San Luis Obispo for anyone that's been there. And it was above um, some old, old bar and tavern in a pretty broke down building that was their first club and it was pretty ratchet but they allowed me to do a class in there because the place was going to be closed in like six months they were planning to phase it out and they're like hey test it out in here let's see how it does so that was like that was this that was the, the foundation of explicit six person class i got to do it there it grew very quickly i was hustling i was at the the bigger club the newer one on uh, Tank Farm Road, it's called, and this was their multiplex. They called it the multiplex, and this is probably where my idea of wanting to run these large sports centers came from. Was this great facility that they had just built when I moved to San Luis Obispo? So I was in there wearing a body pad, wearing hand pads, running around like a madman, saying "Hit me!" and handing people a pair of gloves and trying to just basically door-to-door -door salesmen and bug people during their workout. And um, somehow it, I got enough enough traction to where my class size started to grow. It came to the point where they were going to be closing that club. And I had at this point, probably 30, 20 to 30, like regular members. And so all of a sudden I'm making decent money for a 20 year old. Uh, I'm working my ass off. I have started making sacrifices. I'm not going to, I'm not going out on the weekends. I'm just focusing on school and building this, this little brand, this little business that I started. Then, the, then they drop the hammer. Brett says, hey, I know your program's been doing well, but we're closing that location. And my heart dropped. I said, but Brett, like I've built this thing and these people want to do it and there's no room at Kennedy Club Multiplex. Like, what am I going to do? And he says, we see the value in what you're doing and I want you to be able to bring that to the, to the club, the new club. Here is the credit card. You have a $20,000 budget to build an outside boxing facility on the pool deck. It was the only room they had. And so here I am with this opportunity. I have this budget, never worked with a budget before in my life, and a timeline, and I got a guy who's going to help me put the whole thing together. So uh, we built, I believe it was like a 500, four 500 square foot raised deck on the pool deck, away from the pool. And I got an outdoor tent, very like a permanent outdoor tent and they let me do a sound system i put up my bag rig and now i all of a sudden had my very own boxing facility within kennedy club fitness i was able to start my business within them i was still an employee but they treated me like an independent contractor almost so that was where i realized that this was going to be my career is because i was my own boss they didn't tell me what to do they didn't even tell me how to advertise. I was just making them enough money that they were going to let me run with it. And uh, that very next month after starting that boxing facility at 
multiplex, uh, I broke the 25 year sales record, which was from the day that they opened. One of the most proud moments of my life, obviously at that time, the most proud moment of my life. I was uneducated. I, I had a couple of you know, semesters at a G, as a JC. I had just gotten certified as a personal trainer. Some of the top minds in the country when it comes to exercise, science, um, kinesiology, were in San Luis Obispo. Their kines department is one of the best in the country. And so my coworkers were these highly educated, highly successful D1 athletes that were kines degrees and they were blew me away as far as it, as far as education and knowledge came. And here I was, I broke that record. I was the top guy making the biggest sales. And then I broke my own record the next month. And um, I think that was kind of my awakening and where I, I stopped guess, second guessing myself and stopped uh, worrying about how smart I was or I wasn't and understanding that being industrious is more important than being intelligent in a lot of ways, especially when it comes to creation and entrepreneurship. And so that, and since then it's just been off to the races. No, I love that. That's amazing. I want to kind of go back to, you know, are you still in contact with the general manager that kind of gave you the chance? That's, uh, that's a great question. I am. Um, So over the, over the years I've, I've, worked for other companies and been contracted to work at these major trade shows. URSA and IDEA conventions are the largest trade shows in the United States as far as fitness. And I ran into the GM, the owner and his son that I all knew very well at one of these trade shows in 2016. I hadn't spoken to any of them for six, seven years, not a peep. And we hit it off right away and had a really good conversation. There was no bad blood, even though I left on a dime. Like I, and we can get to this, but I, I, had all that going for me and I dropped it on a dime on them and left them high and dry. And uh they weren't happy at the time, but they got it. He understood the GM especially. And so yeah. to know that there was no bad blood once I saw them again really was nice. And we hit it off and I've actually approached them with Count It and my franchise idea. And uh it's been it's been received with pretty interesting interested eyes and so they want to have some further conversations so things are coming full circle with that relationship which is really cool yeah i kind of want to touch on this point too it's kind of like a business leader entrepreneurship type thing of you know they took a a cool chance on you right and and how do we how do leaders is that just a skill you have to attain and seeing the value they saw in you to be like hey you know hey chad you know you're obviously a hustler we're going to give you this leeway to you know probably the big organization that wouldn't be able to happen but you know, how do you replicate that, right? And give give people a chance to go out there and maybe fail, but you you know they're going to hustle and really give them that chance, right? Because a lot of times people don't get that. It's tough and it's a big risk, especially on the part of the corporation. And I'm the perfect example of why. It's because you've got someone who is dead set on being their own boss and has a yeah. very unique uh, artisanal product or service that cannot be duplicated without that person. So by giving them power and money and time and energy within your corporation, you're taking a huge risk because when that person inevitably wants to go out on their own and do what they had always wanted to do to begin with, or they leave for one reason or another, you're, you're, you're dead in the water. Right. Just like they were, they tried to bring other people in. I actually spent some time trying to train some of the other trainers to take the program over that I was leaving, but the program was me. You know, I, I was, the energy behind it. It was people were buying Chad Yarvitz's boxing program. They weren't just buying Kennedy club fitness's boxing program. So I when I yeah. left it deteriorated, so it is tough. And I think as a business owner or a corporation, when you see that kind of talent and mindset, you have to know going into it, what the potential is and weigh the pot, the, the pros and cons. Is it worth it to do it? Do we partner up early in a way where, we can be mutually beneficial moving into the future once they're ready to grow beyond these walls, so on and so forth. Yeah. Had I stayed in San Luis Obispo, I would have stayed with them. We would have been, we had already started discussing opening um, a, an exterior facility away from the club or sharing a wall, but it being its own business and us being business partners. But I, yeah. I, I flipped my life uh, on its head again and, and just peaced out on it completely. <laughs> yeah. So, so is that is that when you, you know, because I know mm-hmm. you did competitive boxing, right? And, and is that when you moved into uh, boxing 
um, you know, personally versus, yeah, you know, versus so, training? Yeah, um, so following females across the country, chapter two. So I had met my <laughs> ex-wife at my club it, at the tent in San Luis Obispo. She walked in on me one day, passed out in between clients, and it was a weird way to meet somebody. Somehow she decided she wanted to be with me after that. But I had, right at that time, I was, my, my program was advancing and people wanted to learn how to spar. And I had done very little actual boxing. I was good at hand pads, speed bag, double hand bag. If you didn't put me in with somebody, I look like a pro. As soon as I go in with somebody, I look like a real amateur, real fast. You could, I'm exposed. Right. So I knew that at that point, if I wanted to take my career farther and be an, a boxing fitness expert of any kind, I needed more boxing experience. But I was also an athlete, right? And I was 20 years old, and the time clock was ticking. My I had struck out on getting a D1 scholarship in football. My ego wasn't going to let me just stop pursuing athletics. And I knew if I didn't go as hard as I could and pursue boxing and see where I could get, I was going to forever have that regret. And I knew that it was a, a very time-sensitive thing. So I started to travel between San Luis Obispo and Los Angeles. We were looking for a trainer because LA was basically the closest boxing hub. You know, there's Vegas, then there's East Coast, Philadelphia, and all these other areas where there's high boxing. But there was no boxing in San Luis Obispo, Central Coast, north, either north of that. So I had to go to, to LA. So I started making the trek back and forth to find a boxing trainer. And that just kept snowballing until I did find a boxing trainer. And then I realized that I can't do both. I can't commute to San Luis Obispo, work half the week, and then come and try and box in LA half the week. It just so happened that my ex-wife at my time, who then became my girlfriend, was from the Los Angeles area, which was right where I was boxing anyway. She was graduating. She was moving back to LA for short term to see if she could um, go to uh, uh, another school, post-grad. So I packed my stuff up. She packed her stuff up, and I committed to boxing full-time. I had to tell I had to tell this company, hey, I know you guys just invested 20 G's in me. I'm out. And this is at 21 years old. I'm making, I think at that time, I, I had just cleared six figures. And so I was stupid as hell to drop <laughs> all of that and move. And I had just gotten accepted into Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Finally, my dumb ass had done enough. Three JCs later had done enough to get accepted into their architecture program, which was which is a very difficult program to get into. I wanted to be a real estate developer. I had decided somewhere along the way. So I drop out of school, get my tuition money back, quit the job. I go and I move in with my dad in LA and um, dedicate 110% to boxing and doing some little personal training on the side to just try and squeak by a living while I pursued this passion, this dream to maybe one day become a world champion. All in mind, knowing that in my pursuit of being a competitive world class boxer, if that fails, I will only advance my training career. So there was a plan B, right? I'm sure. going to push yeah. this sport as far as I can push it while I have the time to push it. And walking away from it, I will only be a better boxing trainer and businessman, worst case scenario. Yeah, which walking away, I mean, at 21, walking yeah. away from six figures, right? And, and having that force, you know, that's that, that's another thing that I think, um, you know, people who aren't exposed to entrepreneurship, right, at an early age, they, they have a hard time grasping the uh, giving up current cash flow for the potential of what, you know, for like, yes, this is great cash flow, but I, it's only ever going to mm -hmm. come in this way, yeah. right? And if I do these things, it's going to open up these other avenues. So, you know, I guess props to you. So. Um, and then for your boxing career, right? So you did go on, you did, you know, uh, what, you got the, uh, the, the golden glove. Yeah. Champion, so I had, correct? uh, I went on to have seven amateur fights. I lost one of those. And, uh, then I had, after that loss, I won California, uh, golden gloves regional tournament in Los Angeles. Lincoln park is where they hold the regional tournament. And that's one of the largest golden glove tournaments in the nation. Um, Regional is smaller than statewide, which is smaller than national, right? But I was um, a novice boxer. So if you've got 10 fights or less, you're in the novice division. If you've got uh, 10 fights or more, you can be in the open division. So I was the, the 152-pound novice regional champion, uh, Golden Glove champion. And it was a week-long tournament, and I fought 
fought two times because there was a bye. And I won. I won the Gal- California Golden Glove. Very next fight, um, my seventh, sixth, seventh amateur fight, I got my nose shattered in the first round. This was a fight in Long Beach, and um, nose got shattered. It was, you, you think you're devastated. You think your career's over. A lot of guys talk about it. as soon as your nose breaks, it's over. And I, this, hit, this happened in the first round of this fight. And uh, I, long story short, I went on to win that fight almost by knockout. And at that point, me and my trainer sat down and had a discussion on, are we going to continue to fight amateur and risk injury, or are we going to try and turn pro? Turning pro after seven amateur fights, I never advise anybody to do that. It was, <laughs> it's, uh, you need a lot more experience than that. But um, I didn't have the time, um, and I had a big ego, and I wanted to get this thing moving along. I want to get where I want to go. And so I turned pro after that, and I won my, my pro debut by unanimous decision as well in August of 2009. At that point, I was in the circuit. I was training at Wild Card Gym in Hollywood. Uh, Freddie Roach, world famous trainer. I I had met Pacquiao, and I became sparring partner to some world champions: Amir Khan, Jose Benavidez Jr., um, Raymundo Beltran. A couple of these guys who who went on to world, win world championships and be very very highly regarded in that sport. So it was two and a half years of broken bones, um, peeing blood. Uh, perforated eardrums. I was in it. I was, I was, I was full on in it and I was ready to pursue it till the end. I wanted to go out on a stretcher if I had to, but world championship was the only thing I could focus on. And so yeah. my training career kind of became secondary um, to that goal. And uh, I pursued that for, for a couple of years until, until I realized that it was going to take crossing a line of, truly being willing to go out on a stretcher and sacrifice my faculties to get to that point in the sport. Again, I'm coming into it late. A lot of these guys had 300 amateur fights. I had seven. These guys have been boxing since they were five. I had truly, really competitively been boxing for a year and a half. So although I was a very good athlete, um, you can't make up for that experience and time in the game. And so I was taking a lot of damage to be competitive. Um, and I realized that if I was going to continue down that path, I was going to have to be willing to sacrifice my health. And at that point, me and my girlfriend were getting serious, talking about family, talking about marriage. And I started to have, uh, I, guess, I guess I kind of had, uh, I realized my mortality uh, yeah, and, right. and started to see the, see the light. And I decided that it was not going to be worth it for me to be pursue a world championship if one day I was sitting in a wheelchair mumbling and drooling on myself and eating my diaper. Yeah, that's like me on a Saturday, so it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to choose to be in a diaper. I don't want to be forced into one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, uh, yeah, I mean, so, so you like gave you know did two and a half years of like basically everything, right? Like all in, and then you kind of swapped over and you kind of you know had that epiphany of like, hey, I, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing, but it kind of gave you that street cred, right? Like it was now you kind of had had done it right you could say i've i've done x y and z I've, I've been a boxer and you know that plan b kind of started to make sense again exactly not that i ever really cared what other people thought but in my mind it was no one can tell me i don't know about boxing now nobody can tell me i'm not the expert in boxing now so no one's yeah. going to tell me that they're going to teach about boxing better than me and that was the confidence that i needed to then go back into yeah. Obviously, if you haven't gathered by this point, I'm an all or nothing guy, and it's been to my detriment so many times, but it works out in business if you just decide you're not going to be beaten and you're just deciding you're going to get up one more time than you get knocked down. The boxing career became the analogy to my life, and it boxing is life. A 12-round fight, a four-round fight, you live and die in that ring. You're born on the first bell. You go through trials and tribulations. You have a great round, and then you get beat similar to any other loss in life. And you, you have sure. to endure. There's no escape. There's no time out. There's no getting out of it. You're faced with it, deal with it. And so it was the best education I could have ever gotten. And it, and it prepared me for this damn roller coaster I've been on ever since. And yeah. uh, nothing is harder than boxing. Nothing is harder than being to know what's worse is I, I wasn't the best. And so we'd go to these, boxing gyms and catch sparring i get my ass whooped i had to go spar that guy again tomorrow 
knowing that I had no chance at beating him, knowing I was going to get my ass whooped. So it's like going and facing the bully over and over again, <laughs> yeah. knowing you're just going to take your licking and have to deal with it. And yeah, overcoming that and then becoming better than that guy and then eventually beating that person, I had such confidence going back into any industry. You could have thrown me into anything and I would have had the confidence to know that I was going to eventually figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. So a quick side tangent. I mean, kind of talk about the boxing world just for a second. I mean, the, you know, those guys are freak. I mean, you, you were around it. Those guys are freak athletes that get to that level. Right. I mean, yeah. it's, it's not, that's not an accident, right? That guy's just not like, Oh, hey, that guy can fight really good. So he decided to become a boxer and he started punching. That's like, that's not the thing. Right. What's interesting. And it's a really good question. Uh, I talked with my, my girlfriend about this recently because she, she knows a guy who's not super athletic, but he's very good as a boxer and he's actually got a very high winning record. What's interesting about boxing and you can compare it to golf while being a superior athlete is always an advantage. Some of these guys in this sport are not great athletes, but they've been doing it since they were five years old and it is such a skilled discipline and it takes so much control and learning how to regulate adrenaline and be in a stressful environment that uh, you need the will and the skill, but the will is always more important than the skill. I just butchered yeah. the shit out of Ollie's uh, <laughs> quote, but that's essentially it, right? Um, uh, uh, hard work, work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And it, this is a perfect example, and so is golf, right? We can, I think a lot of right. us can relate to golf. Some of these guys are – John Daly, the guy's a fat pig, but – and he may not be an athlete, but goddamn, he's he's yeah. super competitive. And right. That's another thing I learned is I would go in and be the, I was ripped. I was in shape. I was better trained than everyone. Cause I was a personal trainer, get my ass whooped by this little Mexican dude who was 20 pounds lighter than me, not an ounce of muscle on his body, dancing circles around me and making me look like a fool. So it was, <laughs> it's so many lessons. It's, it's, it's every lesson in my life has been taught yeah. by that sport. Yeah. Wow. That's, yeah, I mean, and just you know, and plus it has its own subculture, and you know, that you kind of you know don't know about until you kind of get into it, and you know, all right. the, the boxing gyms, and that's yeah, uh, that's really cool. That's it. That's it. Which it, it, you know, for our listeners who haven't tried boxing uh, either, yeah. I mean, you know, so when I started going to explicit, I mean, I, I was running like you know, twelve miles at a time, uh, swimming one to three miles at a time, right, like working out like crazy, and then it was like three minutes in a boxing ring, and I was like. I oh, ever yeah. worked yeah. out ever in my entire life? Like after about after about ninety seconds, you're like, yeah. "This has got to yeah. be over." There's no yeah. way yeah. this yeah. keeps there's, going. There's levels to it. There's being but, in shape, and then there's being in fight shape, and that's a totally different, yeah, different world. And that's the same thing. I went I went into it as the MVP football player in high school, uh, best guy on the team. Thought I was in shape, and that's that was my first exposure to get my ass whipped by by a dude thirty pounds lighter than me, and it was just. It turns your whole existence on its head. Everything you thought you understood yeah. about yourself is just flushed down the toilet. Yeah. Uh, quick yeah. side tangent, uh, uh, parenting advice. So if you ever have any kids that want to fight or, you know, fight with each other, go get the big 16 ounce, you know, 18 ounce, whatever, the big gloves, and just kind of let them go at it for with each other for, you know, a minute and a half. And they Nobody likes getting hit. That sucks. Like everybody sure. thinks that getting you can just take a punch. It's the worst. Like you get punched in the nose and your eyes water up and like oh yeah, it's terrible. And you're I'm like, a true you know, believer you're... of, of yeah. backyard boxing matches for kids, man. Yeah. Um, to yeah. an extent, right? Yeah, right, but, right. Yeah, not for sport. For uh, right, for right. training. You're not, and teaching you're not betting on them on the side with the dad <laughs> on, with, the, with the other dad. I was gonna say if yeah, if you're placing but, bets. Uh... Uh, well, that's where you learn whether you really do want to fight. You know, you got a kid who's yeah. got a tendency to bully or a tendency to be violent you put them in and you let them get humbled and then if they say if they want to come back for more like my like i did then you put them in the sport in a disciplined way and you get, you get right. them to learn and in that process they're not going to be a bully anymore because you get humbled so much that you're done picking on people because you don't know who it is that can whoop your ass you're going to find yeah. out right. the hard way yeah and, and yeah. honestly martial arts is, is the best thing i believe for for children um to learn their place in the world and learn respect and learn discipline and what they're capable of and that they're not yeah. made of glass. You know, it's important. <laughs> Some people, even today, I have adults who just want to get hit. They want to spar or get in a fight to know if they can take a hit. Um, 
it's nice to know that at a young age to know what you what you can take. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so so when you shifted out of um, you know, when you shifted out of uh, you know, uh, professional boxing, did you did you go back to a gym and a W two job, or did you say, hey, I want to I want to jump straight on that entrepreneurial yeah uh, career path? Um, following females part three. So I. Uh, we were in Los Angeles, <laughs> and my uh, ex-wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, she got accepted to USD for their nursing program, and so she moved there. I was still in LA, still competing, but this was at the end of where I realized I was at the end of my rope with competitive boxing. So she moved down there. I started um, traveling between LA and San Diego, doing the two doing the two life thing. Until I realized that that's what I was going to do. I was going to move down there with her. We were going to build this life together. So I started advertising on Craigslist uh, and looking for any gym job. Again, it was tough. It's tough to get your foot in the door. So I I uh, applied for everything. Barry's Boot Camp, which I did end up getting employed at. A family gym on Coronado Island, which I did end up getting employed at. And then personal training on Craigslist. Uh, and if you're ever looking to find... The, the most interesting characters in society advertise your services on Craigslist. You will find them. Um, I have some stories about that. And uh, this is a family I, show, Chad. Family show. Yeah, yeah. I should have <laughs> could have easily been swallowed up in more naked <laughs> dudes with uh, blow yeah. dryers. <laughs> I could have easily been swallowed into the into the sex trade industry had I not been careful. Uh, but. So I got these jobs. I got these uh, odds and ends. I got a job at, at Kennedy Club working a couple hours a week. I got a job at Barry's Boot Camp being a trainer. And I got a couple clients in, in uh, off Craigslist. And so that just kept going and kept molding. And I kept wanting. Now, I had this idea about what I had in San Luis Obispo. I had this club. I'm going to do this club again at some point. I just can't just, you don't just walk into a new state and a new, a, a new city and decide you're going to have 30 clients that are going to pay your bills. So I got these jobs just learning about now boutique industry. I hadn't worked in a boutique facility, so it was great to be a trainer at Barry's Boot Camp. And then I worked at Family Gym, and they gave me the same uh, opportunity to build a little boxing program. I had six person classes. They let me put bags up, and it was successful. And um, fast forward, uh, the owner of that gym withheld some checks from me. He ended up being a very shady character, gave me a bad taste in my mouth. And my uh, ex and my and I at the time, we rented a house and I made sure to rent a house that had a spare room that was going to be able to be a personal training room. And it was a garage, a detached garage. It's 300 square feet. I built my gym out, used what savings I had to build this small gym out, started bringing my Craigslist clients in there started bringing my Barry's boot camp clients who heard through the grapevine that I was doing some boxing training on the side, started to leech some of the train the clients from the gym I was working at in San Luis Obispo into my, into my gym in my garage. And before I knew it, I had clients all day and my neighbors were starting to complain about parking and the noise. And I realized that this was short lived as much as I loved it because I had no overhead. Uh, I wish I could go back to working out of a garage. Now, um, I knew that, that my time was ticking to get a brick and mortar and figure out how to turn this into a legitimate business uh, before it got shut down. And then I was left starting from scratch again. So that is what forced me that and getting my checks bounced by this guy who owed me a lot of money reiterated that I don't want to work for somebody. I don't want anyone to control my life. I want to do this all on my own. And that this, this time crunch of neighbors getting fed up with the neighborhood noise. So I went out and within a month we had uh, secured our first brick and mortar. And that's when explicit fitness was, was really born. It was April 1st of 2011, April fool's day, um, which is, uh, <laughs> which is silly and it makes sense. But yeah, that was when we opened our doors for the first time. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, you know, kind of the, you know, the path, you know, since then, what has it kind of, kind of been to where you're at now, you know, um, Kind of talk about those some of those ups and downs. Yeah, and that's kind of you know what I had opened with at the beginning of this conversation is uh, being a great trainer and being a business person are two completely different like ends of miles apart, right? Like, and I I had this ego about me, right? I was a 
Golden Glove champion. I'm the best boxing instructor around. I've been in the fitness industry for a while. I've worked as a front desk person. I know what's going on. I can run a club. And out of your garage, it's relatively easy. You don't have the bills. You don't have the business license. You don't have all of the things that pile up. You don't need a, a janitor. So opening this first club, um, I realized very quickly that it was going to be more expense than I thought. And I didn't budget anything. I was making four grand a month guaranteed by my garage clients. And I figured if I can get a place that's two grand a month, I've got enough buffer there to pay my bills, afford gas, and fill in the gap. Uh, and so I did it. With, with I, I, The smart thing I did was I asked my clients that were with me in my garage, hey, would you sign a long-term contract with me so I can guarantee that I'm going to be able to pay these this rent and they did and so i went into the space at least knowing that i had my my rent covered every month i had x amount of clients that i could guarantee so i could take the stress off of there but from that point forward you know realizing you need bookkeeping you need a software system to schedule classes you have to get, become legitimate with the city you have to uh do get a get a license you have to become an llc if you want to take liability off of yourself if you don't want to lose everything you own so it became a a, a mountain very quick what i thought was a little hill to, to overcome became a mountain realizing what i was facing when it comes to yeah. really being a business owner and a legitimate one and so it, it, we did well for a while because our, our cost was low clients were coming i was i was siphoning all these clients from my other jobs Sure enough, those jobs ended. It was conflict of interest at Barry's boot camp. The guy screwed me over, over in a family gym. So now my funnel of new faces and clients had run dry. So now how do we make this a self-sustaining model? And that was another hurdle. Okay, do we do paid advertising? Do we do Groupon? Blah blah. Uh, Groupon became at that time Groupon was at its height. It was like 2011, and that's where we got all of our clients. I mean, everybody came in, and I had built the classes around being able to handle that load of clients with the intention of turning hopefully 20% over in the industry fitness industry. If you're turning 20% of your first interactions into paying clients, that's a really good turnover rate. So I had that sure. stuck in my head. If we can turn 20% of everyone that comes in this door, we'll be successful. So now it was just about getting bodies in the door, which we did with Groupon. Thankfully, without Groupon, I would not be in business today. Well, well, so quick tent. Another quick side note, Groupon should have taken the $6 billion buyout from uh, from Google in 2011. They sure <laughs> should have. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. They sure should have. They're now, they're not hey, if I get offered $6 billion, guys, trust me, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> out. Yeah, they're, they're, they're You'll never now, see uh, me again. They're now lumped yeah, in the, uh, the blockbuster uh, category. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, uh, and not the definition of blockbuster, but the company blockbuster, which is right. quite ironic. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, well, hey, so, so – yeah. You know, we're we're heading into um, you know, we're heading into you know, it's going to be good content for episode two, right? We want to get uh, you know, now that we know how explicit fitness got its first brick and mortar, yeah. going to go through that ups and downs, and also uh, how you've really innovated in the space, right? With count it, um, and then also, I mean, trying to innovate uh, in a saturated market like the you know fitness industry in San Diego, mm -hmm. yeah. right? There's there's got to be uh, some uniqueness there, so. We sure. will um, wrap up there. Do you want to give everyone maybe a, a two minute um, preview of just count it and and the um, you know maybe a little deeper dive of the technology that you've uh, developed there? Yeah. So count it is our technology company. It's our sister company to Explicit Fitness. So we have a sensor mat that we have been able to uh, custom build into our bags that tracks your boxing performance your power, your speed, and your metrics. And with those metrics, we're able to gamify the boxing experience and give you immediate feedback and eventually build out an app and a, and a gaming space, essentially, where you can have an avatar, you can level up, and you'll be able to challenge your friends to fights across the country. This has given us the ability to franchise explicit fitness, but also create a SaaS model that we will be able to sell our hardware sensor and license our software, which is the Count It uh, technology and the Count It software to other businesses. We're now going to be able to empower other fitness facilities 
to use technology to offer a staffing free boxing solution where they never could before. And that's kind of the magic behind Calvin. Dad Yarvitz kicking ass and making sass. So there you go. (laughs) Thanks, man. (laughs) Josh is probably going to text Jay like, you can cut that joke out. (laughs) <laughs> that was, that was a good one. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, awesome. That's it. Well, we are classic dad joke by Mark. I love it. We are uh, excited to <laughs> yeah. hear more about that. Uh, we will quickly do a speed round and then head into um, and we'll head into episode two. Awesome. So, speed round. Uh, question number one. So, if you were to give homeschoolers or parents of homeschoolers uh, advice about entrepreneurship or finding a career, uh, what is that advice? Hmm. Great question. Um, let your kids be themselves. Some people, some kids are going to be super naturally drawn to school and good at it. And some kids aren't. And while it's important to learn and pay attention and know how to take tests and know how to, uh, finish assignments. If school is not what your child excels at, allow them to explore what they love and, just support it because what they love could turn into the best darn pottery company in the world. And they might be a ceramics expert and then get paid, you know, thousands of dollars by a celebrity to come and custom make some pottery for them. Like don't, don't squash your, your kid's creativity and imagination. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Okay. So what's the biggest uh, question too? What is the biggest piece of total crap advice that entrepreneurs hear or believe that's just total bs i think a hot topic right now is hustle culture um (laughs) which is a sensitive subject for me because i i do love to hustle and if i hadn't hustled as hard as i did at the beginning of creating my business it probably wouldn't be where it is today but work smarter not harder create systems and processes that eliminate the manual work that you have to do like it's from day one systems and processes that are going to simplify your life don't keep spinning your wheels and doing this repetitive work that can be made into a process that you don't have to think about all the time because if you're really an entrepreneur you're thinking about what's next you're trying to create and if you're constantly bogged down with what's been done and you could just make it automatic then you're holding yourself back uh, uh, question number three. So, uh, off the, off the business, uh, topics, if you've been sticking to your diet and workout routine religiously and you're cutting yourself some slack, where are you, uh, booking a trip to? If I'm going to take a vacation and go somewhere yeah. and, and be chunky. Yeah. yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere with, uh, all inclusive drinks and food. No doubt about that. So. <laughs> Probably Cabo is a really good one because it's easy. It's quick from San Diego, two-hour flight. You've, uh, you're in a resort, and you just get to melt in the lawn chair and, and drink Mai Tais all day and eat buffet <laughs> yeah. food. I'm a buffet freak, man. I love it. <laughs> I Give love it, it to me with the COVID on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Extra COVID. All right, last question. So you're setting up a celebrity boxing match between any two celebrities. Who are, you, who are people going to pay, and who are you going to put in the ring to go at it? Ooh, uh, Elon Musk called out Vladimir Putin recently, and I <laughs> would, uh, awesome. <laughs> love to see that. See them that both train, like of the century, full training camp, like Rocky episodes. Them smack, yes. you know, Putin be smacking slabs of meat, and Elon be over there like hooked up to some weird electronical device. <laughs> oh, dude, it'd be it'd be great. Oh, that would be classic. It. Yeah. Well, there we go. Putin, hey, uh, Putin, if you're Musk. listening, uh, uh, you know, you yeah. and you and Musk, let's let's get it organized. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If let's we do it, I will. I will make this. I will make that my. If either of them are interested, I will stop what I'm doing and kind of make that my life's work for at least a month to try and put that on. We will. I would try and make that happen. Dude, and I they think- should both do it on the International Space Station. They both have the rockets to get there. <laughs> a zero gravity boxing match. Yeah. If I yeah. made one percent of the revenue generated from that fight, I would never work another day <laughs> in my life. <laughs> None of oh, us. Would. Yeah, no. yeah. I'd be me. I, I, I'd be going to Chipotle. I'd be getting the guac. Like, but yeah, nah, yeah. you. I got one percent of that fight. Yeah, no, I'm. Yeah. Good. Dude, you'd be getting guac and queso, Mark. No problem. Ball. Oh. 
Chipotle bowl. Oh, oh, awesome. awesome. So perfect. Well, thank you so much for being on. Really excited to hear about how you developed uh, Count It, how you're, how you're bringing explicit, uh, you know, hopefully global. Um, uh, and yeah, can't, can't wait to hear more about it. Sweet, man. Thanks so. for having me, you guys. So Chad, just real quick for our listeners, how can people kind of get a hold of you, find out about explicit and count it and kind of what's, what's the, uh, the connection? We'll put all this in the show notes. Sure. We, yeah, we have a website, uh, explicitfitness.com. That's spelled with no E in front. Don't know if you can see it here, but X-P-L-I-C-I-T fitness.com. Also, that's our Instagram handle, no space, explicit fitness. That's where we've got all our content, our brand new facility. Uh, we're showcasing the technology there as well. We're in the process of building out our website and Instagram and social media presence for Count It as well. But okay. any of our videos, anything you see, you're going to see the Count It technology in there being implemented and used and successful in our club already. Perfect. Yeah, th- those will all be in the show notes. Um, and then, uh, Chad, when, when uh, everything gets uh, launched for Count It, uh, let me know, and I'll just update the show notes with all the uh, you know additional uh, handles for Count It. So, cool. Um, awesome. Uh, and lastly, um, as always, nothing we can say, uh, nothing we say can or should be taken as tax legal or financial advice. Uh, so, if you hear anything interesting, uh, go seek professional counsel first. So, anyway, thank you so much, everyone, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks for listening, everybody.